I'm going to repeat the topic today. Parenting God's way. Why do I say parenting God's way? Because there are many ways that you can parent your children. But there is only one way as children of God that we can parent the children, and that's God's way. So today, I want to submit to us the way that God has recommended in his word the way we ought to raise our children. Like Pastor Olimide says, or said earlier, I have two lovely boys that I parent alongside with my husband and under the headship of my husband. And I really give God praise because God has taught me a lot through parenting. I've come to understand the father heart of God. I've come to realize my responsibilities as a parent. And I've come to understand the benefits that I enjoy as a child of God. So there are so many levels at which parenting addresses our lives. You know, this week gone has been the half term. So every parent knows when it's half term, your life changes, you know? Maybe you're going to work, you know, it's either you have to make time from work, or even if you're a full-time mother, when the children are, you know, full-time housewife, I mean, when your children are half term, things change. Because one day, two days, they're at home, then you begin to hear, Mom, I'm bored. <laughs> and then you think, wow, how am I going to entertain these people? You know, these little people that I have in my, you know, that God has given to me. So, this week gone, I had the privilege to make some time for my children and we went to the fair. And I never planned it. Let me rewind a little bit and go like on Tuesday, as I woke up in the morning, I felt the Lord impressed on my heart to discuss a topic with my son. And I just wondered, mm, why do I need to? I didn't know that God was preparing my heart. And so I prayed about it, as I normally do. And I said, okay, God, I'll wait for an opportune time. So we went on Friday. I took time off, and, and, and I went on Friday with the boys to the park. And then my son asked me a question. And I thought, wow, God, you are so good because you have prepared me. And my son asked me, my son is 15, going 16, and he asked me about sex. And the thought that I had earlier on was God saying to me, I need you to speak to David about sex. And I'm like, really? You know? So when he asked me that question, first of all, I said, Lord, thank you, because you have prepared me. And then I began to speak to him. His younger brother was with us as well. So I took time out and I gave an age appropriate education. And then I got home and I said to my husband, I said, I really thank God that God gave me this opportunity because I was able to really speak to our children in a way that I've never done before. And I think it's because God has spoken to me and you know we discussed them and we just really thank God. What am I driving at? Parenting is a gift from God. You know, there are some times when we look at our children and we think, oh, you know, and then you wonder, but these are people that you prayed so hard for. But sometimes we don't appreciate them enough because God has placed them in our lives for a particular purpose. And so as I go into our message today, I narrated all of that because we'll be coming back to some of the things that I've mentioned earlier. Like I said, parenting, God's way. Sociology makes us to understand that the family unit is the smallest unit in the society. And so when you look at the home, when you look at the family, you begin to realize 
that God has a purpose, God has a plan, he has a standard. You look at the Garden of Eden, when God placed Adam there and gave him Eve, he said Eve would be her help, his helpmate to supply, to be there, to work alongside her husband. There was order. I just want us to see the father heart of God. When they fell and he came into the garden, they had made alternative clothing for themselves. But God the Father, he knew that that was not enough covering for them. And he clothed them in animal skin. That's the Father heart of God. And even though he was not happy about what happened, look at the way God responded to the fall. Immediately, he was already making provision for them to come out of the situation. They had put themselves in. Yes, they had a curse. Adam was supposed to till the land from then, from then on. He didn't have the fresh supply of everything that he had before. But God still made provision. And today we are enjoying that provision that God made for Adam and Eve in the person of Christ Jesus our Lord. When we look at the family setting, like I said, the family unit is the smallest unit in the society. It means that the family is a prototype, if I can use that word. Whatever goes on in our homes is supposed to be reflected in the society. So can we imagine if every home is a godly home, what will happen in society? If we all follow God's standard within the confines of our homes, and then we go out and we act out what we have been taught and what we have taught our children, can you just imagine how the society will be? And I'm laying all of this because some of us don't realize that raising children is an assignment from God. When our mindset changes and we change the way we think, then our approach to life will change tremendously. These are the telltale signs of age when you have to put on your glasses. As a parent, what do we allow our children to watch? Where do we allow our children to go? How do we raise them up? Do we have different standards? We come to church, we behave one way, then we go home and we behave another way. And our children are looking at us, remember? They're looking at us. They're studying us, actually. My children pick up on every word that I say. Oh, mom, what you said. They're so quick. Because we are what they read. Whatever we tell them is what they're going to take outside. So we need to begin to realize just how important the family union is to God. When I look at Isaac and Rebecca, just to give us a few examples of parenting in the Bible, when you look at Isaac and Rebecca, do you think they did a good job of parenting? They had twins, but they split the loyalty of their children. Can you imagine that? What kind of a home is that? When you split the loyalty of your children, Isaac took Jacob, Rebecca took, I mean, Isaac took uh, Esau, and Rebecca took Jacob. Already there is chaos in that home. Do you see? They had set the children up to fail. They split the loyalty of their children. 
That's an example of parenting in the Bible. And you remember, the Bible says that all the things that are written in Scripture are lessons for us to learn from. They're not just stories. It's the word of God for us to learn from so that we know how not to behave. But how many of us please have split the loyalty of our children in our homes? Daddy tells them off and you go, don't mind daddy, you know. I've told you, when daddy is here, this is the way you should behave. When he's gone now to work, this home is our own and we'll do whatever we like. Some of us are like that. I know people who do that. But is that parenting God's way? We're setting up our children to fail when we do that. Or daddy does the reverse. Mommy says something, you know, you know your mom. She will talk, 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 talk. She nags us all the time in the house. Let her go. Once she's left, then we'll do this house the way we want to and make it comfortable for us. That's what we do sometimes. But then we come to church and we all pray, and we all sing, and we jump and shout. But the state of our home is a bringing glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. I want us to read Jeremiah chapter 35, 13 to 14. If the media team can bring it up, please. That's another example of parenting in the Bible that I want to bring to our attention and to our notice. And the reason why I want us to read it, A, I know it's not popular, B, because there is something there that we can take home with us. Jeremiah 35, 13 to 14. Right, I think I need to read it by myself. <laughs> right, it says, God saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of, East of Jerusalem Will ye not receive instruction to hearken to my words, saith the Lord? The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are performed for unto this day they drink none, but obey their father's commandment. Notwithstanding, I have spoken unto you, rising early, and speaking, but ye hearken not unto me. These were the words of Jeremiah, of God, to the children of Israel. What had happened was, God said about the children of Israel that they were not hearkening unto what he had said to him. And so God lifted up this family in the whole nation of Israel as a standard. He said, look at this. This is just a man that has instructed his family generations and they never moved away from the instruction of their father. And what was it that they would not touch alcohol? How much weight do our words carry with our children? And not because they don't want to hear it, not because they don't want to hearken onto it, but because our children do what we do rather than what we say. Our children do what we do rather than what we say. Whatever our children see us do, they will do it. And so, no matter how many lectures we give our children, they're looking at our lives. They're following the examples that we are laying down for them. That's what they're going to do. Because that registers much more in their minds. That's why Jesus said it. He said to um, you know, his disciples, he said, look at the Pharisees. Do what they say, but don't do what they do. Because he knew they were the religious standard of the time. And everybody will follow what the Pharisees and the Sadducees say. Because they were the authority. 
But Jesus warned them. He said, don't do what they do. You can do what they say because they're speaking from the Torah, they're speaking from the Bible as it were, but don't do what they do. There is power in our actions. And so if we want our children to toe the line, it's not enough to just claim promises in the word of God. If you don't line up your life with those promises, they are not going to work. It's not a curse. It is not a curse. If you don't line up your life with the word of God, it's not going to work. And then, you know, we love claiming that scripture as a train of a child in a way that it should go. Some of us know it's inside down, upside down. But part of training your children is also you towing the line. It's not just by words, it's by actions as well. So having laid the foundation of examples of parenting, let's begin to check ourselves. Where do I fall in the parenting category? Am I a bad parent or am I a good parent? And this is not to put anybody down. The word of God is here to reprove us, to correct us, but also to instruct and to also encourage us. And so no matter where we are today in our parenting, there is room for improvement. And as Pastor has declared, there is room for progress. We all need to make changes every day. We all need to improve on our actions every day. Our walk with the Lord is a day by day walk with Him. Moment by moment. So I want to encourage us today, just in case you're like Isaac and Rebecca in your home, you can turn things around in your home. So what is God's will of parenting and what are his expectations? Let's read Malachi 2.15 for us to know the purpose of parenting. Why has God given us children? Malachi 2, 15. And did not he make one, yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And why one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take it to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. And read the A part again. And did not he make one, that's marriage, two people coming together to be one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And why one? That he might seek a godly seed. God's expectation of our union, of our marriage, of our home, is that we raise godly seeds. So when I say to us, that parenting is an assignment. Can we begin to see? Because God has an expectation. So let's begin to ask ourselves, am I meeting God's expectation in my parenting practice or skills? Or do I need to up my game? Am I fulfilling God's plan and God's purpose the way I parent my children? We love to say, you know, children are our future. But we've forgotten that whatever future we want to see in the lives of our children and what we plant in them now, because what you sow, you reap. So whatever we plant into our children is what's going to germinate and that's what their future will be. So if we don't realize that God expects a godly seed from us, we will raise our children anyhow and anyway. And we will not be fulfilling God's plan for having children. And do you know why it's important for us to fulfill God's plan? Because the Bible says that we're no longer our own. We've been bought with a price. So we can't just do whatever we like with our lives because we belong to God. Jesus paid 
paid a very expensive price for us. He laid down his life. So we don't have a right to our lives anymore. We're living according to the standards of God. And that encompasses every area of our lives. Not just when we come to church, but when we go to work, when we go to the supermarket, we're taking Jesus with us. And we're living out the life of Christ in our homes. And our children are looking at us. There are three issues that I want us to consider about parenting. I've mentioned the first one, which is that parenting is an assignment given by God. We're not supposed to raise up our children according to Oprah. You know, she brings inspirational people to her program. Some people take the word of Oprah like the Bible. You know, they live and breathe Oprah. They're not supposed to live according to therapy either. You know, you go to school and they tell you, oh, your children need therapy. They tried it with me and I refused. I said, no way. God is my standard. My children doesn't need anything. We have the word of God and we're sticking by it. If you see anything going on in my life, leave that, in my son's life, leave that with me. And by God's grace, all is well. So we need to realize we're not bringing up our children according to psychology. You know, some of us, we love reading books. And it's fine. But the Bible is our standard. Or is supposed to be our standard. But do we make that Bible our standard in our homes? Let's begin to ask ourselves this question. The second issue I want to raise is our relationship with God. Like I said, our children do what we do. We will tell them, go and read your Bible. Oh, you don't know how to pray at this time. When did you take time to teach him or her how to pray? When was it that you sat them down and you actually explained the gospel? to your children how to be born again how to be saved or you think it's on the school that has that responsibility no that's your responsibility the bible god said to the children of israel to the women she said the bible said when you're, you're going to fetch water talk to your children surround them with the knowledge of god when we were leading prayers you know we made, um, we were given an example of how um, uh, Muslims raise up their children. I'm not saying we should do that, to be honest. But what I'm trying to say is, they take time to deposit in their children what they know. What do we know? What do we know that we're passing on to our children? Have our children really seen us before crying out to God on our knees? Do they know that, ah, oh, mommy is praying, nobody dares disturb her. Or daddy is reading his Bible, it's serious time, he's meeting with God. Have they seen that example in your life? And then we want them to behave well, all of a sudden when they're outside. Because there's a magic that comes from them, when you have not taken time out to train them. I remember there was a time when I was, you know, sort of like impatient with my children. And then God said to me, but Maureen, have you taken time to actually teach them? Maybe they don't know. And then I took that correction on board and I said, actually, do you know this? Do you know that? You know, some of us will send our children, go and bring this from this, 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 this. But they don't know it and they come back, they can't find it. And we're impatient with them. We're irritated by them because they're not doing what we've sent them to do. But have we taken time to actually show them these things and not just expect? You know their expectations. I remember when I when I finished uni. How many of us are from Nigeria? At least that I can vouch for. You know, you're in Nigeria. As a young girl, your parents tell you, don't speak to any man. Okay? Don't speak to any man. And then you graduate. And then they ask you, where's your boyfriend? And I'm like, excuse me? Mom and dad, you told me not to speak to any man. I haven't got any boyfriend. Because they're expecting that this is the next chapter that you need to get married. I'm like, hello, 
I obeyed you. You said no man, no man. So, unless you're going to manufacture one, I don't know what we're going to do about it. But I've said that to bring out something. Sometimes we don't actually say what we mean to our children. Instead of sitting them down and letting them know about the facts of life, we concoct some stories or some whatever, and we miss the opportunity to be the teachers in the lives of our children. We miss the opportunity to be the first person that will tell them about the facts of life. But that's why God brought them into your home. That's why God gave them to you. They are your assignment. They're not just a byproduct of two people coming together. It's serious job. It's serious job. And like everything that God does, he always equips us for the task at hand. If only we would look to him. If only we'll begin to view parenting and see parenting as a gift and an assignment from God. Rather than, you know, these children are here now, in the next phase of life, you get married and you have children. But we never think deeply about our responsibilities to our children. And I'm hoping that today God is going to wake that up in our lives. The third issue is we need to bring up our children as Christians. Did we hear what I said? We need to bring up our children as Christians, not as Nigerians, <laughs> not as British, as Christians. When we gave our lives to Christ, do you know we changed citizenship? I don't know about you, but I'm a citizen of heaven first. And my time here on earth is as an assignment. God has an assignment and a plan for me to fulfill here on earth. That's why I'm still here. Our children are supposed to be brought up as Christians. There are many things that are lovely about our cultures, our natural cultures, our earthly cultures. But I tell you, it's only what we teach them from the word of God that is going to last. Is it respect we're looking for? It's in the Bible. The Bible tells our children to honor our father and their mother. There is nothing about your culture that you're looking for that you will not find in the Bible. The problem is, we are not taking the time to find out what the Bible says about raising our children. Some of us think it's by trial and error. No! The Word of God is full and is complete. And I'm hoping that even those who are looking to God to have children, you know, God has given you this opportunity to hear this this afternoon so that your attitude will change and your perspective will change and the way you raise your children will change. Because we look in the church and we say there are no young people. But have we asked ourselves if we're responsible? Because we live one way and we say the other thing and our children are confused. They can't add up the two. They, it doesn't compute with them. come to church, yes pastor, yes this. But then you get home and you raise your nose to your husband. And they're thinking, but mom, how come you respect pastor and you don't respect dad? Or your dad, it could be the other way around, attends to every sister in church. But then his wife speaks to him, your mom, and you go, please don't bother me now. We have important things that we're saying. And your children are looking at you. Because our children are supposed to learn how to live with one another from us. They see you bickering all the time. It's like there can never be happiness in marriage. That's what we're saying to them. And then they finish university and we're saying, so when are you going to get married? And they're going like, with the example that you gave me, you better forget it. It's not going to happen. Because I've seen enough to put me off. I work a lot with young people. And I know that the perspective out there about marriage, if some of us hear it, it will be shocking to us. Some of our children are not expecting to stay long in marriage. Let me just let you know. 
They don't see it as two people coming together because the burn, they want to make it legal. But as far as commitment is concerned, zero. These are the children that we brought to Sunday school. They're not children who don't know God. The ones that came to Sunday school, yeah? We brought them every Sunday to Sunday school. But because of the confusion and the chaos that is at home, they can't marry the two. And so they, they're not interested in marriage. They're not. And we are responsible. We say our children don't come to church. How can they come to church? We're putting them off by the lives that we're living. Because we don't realize how important our role is as parents. And I trust that the Lord will help us to make amends. Now I want to share vital lessons that our children should learn from us, their parents, which will equip them for life. I've already touched about it. I've got four R's here, and I'll be going through them one by one. The first R is righteous lifestyle, which follows closely to what I've just said about the way we bring up our children, the way we live out our Christian life. I remember my son lost his bag in school. And then when he came home, he was really upset. And dad said, okay, so let's pray about it. You know? And that's our usual, that's our normal response. And what are we doing? Our children have gotten to the level where they know that if anything goes wrong, the first thing we do is pray. It's not okay, I'll buy you another one. It's not okay what happened or blah, blah, blah. Even when they're ill, the first thing we do, pray for them. Why do we do that? Because we want them to know that the only source is God. There's so many things going on through um, WhatsApp now about uh, conservatives wanting to bomb up um, NHS and whatever. But you know, the first thing that came to my mind when I actually saw that was, Thank you, Lord, that I know Jesus as my healer. How many of us know Jesus as our healer? Amen. You know? We may confess it, we may say it, but do we actually live it? Or we have a headache and the first thing we're thinking of, oh, I need to make an appointment with my GP. Sometimes it's also a very good excuse not to go to work. Huh? You know? You want to take sick off. And so you allow your body to rest into the sickness because you're oh, I actually I think I need time to rest. I've been tempted that way, but I said to myself, no, I need to know Jesus as my healer in my body. So I go to work anyway. Okay? Sometimes we tell like we, we take sick off when we're not sick. And then when the sickness comes we wonder why. But we did that to ourselves. We did that to ourselves. And our children are looking at us. And so we prayed about his bag that lost, that got lost, and miraculously, he found the bag. It also happened with his coat, and we found the coat. How many of you know that they're beginning to realize that actually prayer works? That's what we're teaching our children, that prayer works. And so the more we pray and they see answers, the more eager they are to pray the next time. So next time you tell them, let's pray, they're very eager because they're so used to seeing the miracles of God in their parents' lives. And they want to be a part of it. So it's no longer the Bible says or a story. It's real life. And they want to touch it. That's why First John 1 says, the word of God that we have handled. How much of the word of God that have you handled that you can pass on to your children? Remember, the purpose of us being parents is so that we will raise godly seed. The second R is relationships. And I've touched on that as well briefly. Remember I said sociology says that the family is the smallest unit in the society. That's why some children will misbehave. They say, oh, charity begins at home. Maybe she wasn't brought up or he wasn't brought up properly. What about us? How much are we teaching our children about relationship? Do they see mommy and daddy have a quarrel or a row and they make it up? Do you know what you're teaching them there? Conflict resolution. 
You're letting them know that we can disagree, but we can also make up. And then they're happy. My children, they've seen the father and I have a little bit of whatever, and then they see us come out and, you know, we're lovely, lovely, and, and I tell them, I say, yeah, we all disagree. I said, that's why when you and your brother disagree, you need to make up. I said, that's why God has placed you in this family, so you understand the facts of life. You're not going to be in agreement with everybody. But God has brought you within the confines of a home, so you learn how to live with one another. And when they learn endurance from you, when they learn patience, when they learn perseverance, they go outside, they're friendly people. People are always telling us. Even our neighbor stopped, up, stopped us one day and said, oh, I have to tell you, your boys are brilliant. Oh, they did this, they helped me with this, they do that. Why? Because we have instilled it in them. And we've told them, we're not just asking you to do this for mom and dad. We're asking you to be nice to people. The other day, my son said to me, just this week gone, and he said, oh, you know, I tried to help a man, and he refused, and, you know, he wasn't also nice about it. I said, look, you can't blame him. I said, because A, you're black, B, you're a boy. There's so many things not going for you, sweetheart. I said, but, you know, the things that we do, we do them because of God. Not because we want somebody to turn around and say, thank you. But these are disciplines of the heart. So that when you're used to being good, then you're good. It's not turn it on and off. So I'm not saying to my children, when you come to church, help grandma, help this. No, everybody. Because the Bible says, for God so loved the world. The Bible says God makes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. And he makes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. So I tell them, be good, be kind to every human being. But then, when we say that, do they see us talk about sister, whatever, you know? The topic of discussion when we are going home. Did you see her? Hmm. Go to the to their pastor. <laughs> but I finished telling them, don't talk about whatever. But then, we are committing that same thing. My son had picked me up before. He said, oh, mom, you were talking about... So I quickly told him, this is what we were talking about. We were not gossiping, please. You know? And I'm not saying that everybody will please you. But let's choose our words where our children are. I know sometimes people step on your toes and you, you really want to unburden your heart. But you can do that, you know, behind closed doors. Not because you're being hypocritical, but because your children don't know all the facts. Okay? It's not being hypocritical. It's because your children don't know all the facts. And some of the information they may be able to tap or receive will be the one that they will misunderstand. So let's be careful. It's not just lecturing our children. It's leaving it out. So our children learn about relationship. They learn that sometimes it's not very comfortable. I mean, Sleeping beside the same man or the same woman year on, year out. How many of you are doing this? Someone is you wake up and you think, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But we put the flesh down and we remember the commitment we have made. Some of the advice I give single people when I'm talking to single is I always tell them, I would advise you not to live alone. You know why? Because when you live with someone, you can't just pack your bag and baggage. But if you're on your own, you shut your door and think, well, I can't be bothered. But when you're living under the same room with people or with someone, then you know that you have to make room. That's what happened to me. I love being on my own. But I ended up having a roommate or a flatmate. And it was a training ground for me. When I fell out with my friend, this was the friend that I couldn't wait for us to share together. Can you imagine? And that's how we are. Honeymoon period. You know, oh, in fact, sometimes my husband reminds me, he said, oh, boring. And you told me you're going to cut my nails, you're going to do this, you're going to do what I do. That means, please, <laughs> let's move on very quickly. What am I trying to say? <laughs> when you're so used to being on your own and you don't think of other people, then 
when you're in a marriage situation, it'll be very difficult for you to know how to cope with other people. One of the things that God taught me living with a flatmate was I began to discover that she was very good at some things that I was not good at. And I was very good at some things that she wasn't good at. And God taught me to draw on her strength and to use my strength to, you know, make up for the areas that she lacked. So, you know, you can imagine, in fact, it was marriage made in heaven. The reason being, she loves to cook. I love to tidy up. I mean, equation and balance, isn't it? So she makes a mess in the kitchen, I clean it up. But I enjoy the food. Amen? Amen. And that's what relationship, that's how we can teach our children about relationship. They see that daddy comes to the kitchen sometimes. You know, I'm the only girl in the house. I enjoy it so much. You know, they wait on me and I'm just enjoying myself being a princess in the house. You know? And that's what we're teaching our children. Endurance, forbearance. They see it in action. The way, you know, God has blessed you with more than one child, then you see the two of them, the way you help them to make up after their differences. That's how we're teaching our children about relationship. The third one is responsibility. Some of us, in fact, I really thank God for my husband because he started our children early with housework. You know, we complain, it's a small house. You know, they're disturbing me. Like me, I love my space. So I said to my husband, when he said, these children should be watching the place by now, I'm like, ah, but then you know me, I love my space. Well, he, you know, put his foot down and thank God because I'm enjoying it now. Our children learn responsibility from us. Please, put them to work. I have a dear sister in church. She said to her children, she'll put them on the stool and put them to the sink. Wash up after yourself. <laughs> put them to work. Do you know what we're teaching them? Work ethics. They go to work, they will do their work. It won't be that the next week they've chopped them out of work because they've never done a day's work in their life. There's so many things, virtues, that our children can pick up from the home if we begin to see our responsibility, that this is a God-given task. Also, he has equipped us. Because sometimes, you know, we go, oh, parenting is so hard. Please, let's stop confessing that. Parenting is a gift from God. And it is God's assignment, and he has equipped us to do the job very well. The last R that I'm going to talk about is reminder. Reminder. Parenting reminds me that I am a child of God. My children, you know, or our children, I should say, they will make mistakes just like we make mistakes. I have to confess, before I never used to be so accommodating on their mistakes, until God began to say to me, but Maureen, you just did that thing yesterday. You told me you'll never do it again, and you've just done it again. So what am I supposed to do to you? Should I treat you the way you treated David, or the way you treated Daniel? And I'm like, okay, Lord, hands up, I'm guilty. Some of us are so hard on our children. But have we taken time out to think about how many times we break God's heart? We said to them, I've told you the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time I'm going to bring out, I should not mention it. But how many times have we gone back to God over the same issue? And he's been so merciful. So parenting reminds me so much of the love of God. The way he loves me unconditionally. His grace and mercy towards me. And that makes me extend that grace and mercy towards my children. What about us? Because children will remember. There have been times when I've had to apologize to my children. When I felt that I was harsh and the Holy Spirit had convicted me. I actually do it. It's not, that I, it's not just that I think it. I actually go to my child and I say, I'm really sorry. What you did was wrong, but I was also high-handed. And two wrongs do not make it right. And because they see me humble myself before them, 
They're always quick to let me know when they're sorry. And we talk things over. And even if I'm going to punch them for whatever, I explain to them the reason why I can't let this go. Is A, the Bible says, spare the rod and spoil the child. So sometimes, you know, I have to follow God's word. Number two, if you think you can get away with it, you do it next time. And I let them understand that it's not out of the flesh. Remember the Bible says that our parents, they scold us, they reprimand us after the flesh. You know, you have the family reputation. Again, when you're from Africa, you carry the burden of the family name. But as Christians, we also carry our family name. Being believers. So as children of God, that God has extended mercy to, let's learn to extend mercy to our children and love them for who they are and who God has made them to be in our lives. Parenting gives us opportunity to know about God in diverse ways. Sometimes our children speak to us. Sometimes God speaks to us through our children, you know. They say something and you're shocked that it came out of their mouths. So today I want to encourage us about our parenting. And for those of us who, you know, we're waiting on God and trusting God, we're trusting that God will make a way. And for those who have not even started the journey, God has given you an opportunity to hear about it today. So that when you go into marriage and you start rearing children, you have the right mindset, you have the right perspective about bringing up your children. And you know that, first of all, you have a responsibility from God to bring up a godly seed. That's what it's about, a godly seed. And so coming down to our churches and wanting our children to be in church, Let's look into our lives. Let's look into ourselves and begin to ask ourselves, what amends do I have to make? If some of us have to apologize to our children, please let's do so. This is serious business. Because if our children don't come to the Lord because of the way we have lived our lives, God will hold us responsible. I want us to know that. Our first assignment as parents is our children. It's not enough to say, you know, I'm going to work and I'm providing for you. I always tell people, the first three years of our children, my husband and I stayed home. The first one was my husband, the second one, myself. I may not be able to buy a shwebi, okay? I may not be able to take them to get McDonald's every day, but we instilled in them Christian principles. And we're reaping the reward today. So please, I want us to look deep in our heads. And as we bow our heads today, let's speak to God in prayer. Let's begin to bring our parenting before the Lord and say, God, how do I measure up? How do I measure up? Comparing my parenting skills to your standards, how do I measure up? Please speak to me. Where do I need to make amends? How are you correcting me in the way that I'm raising my children? So that I, my children won't leave church because of me. But that they'll come to love the Lord because of me. They'll say, Mom, we love the way you love the Lord. My son said that to me. He said, Mom, I want to be like you. I mean, what's the greatest compliment you can ever have from your children? If they tell you they want to be like you. So I'm just going to invite Pastor to round us up in prayer as we pray and speak to the Lord. Amen. Shall we fall our feet? You want questions? Time is up. Okay, come. Two, three questions. You want to start? Okay. <laughs> Somebody get the microphone. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.